Welcome back to Sissy Maya. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to never miss an update. Additionally, consider subscribing to my Patreon to get access to these features, and much more. I felt drained from the emotions of the previous night, and I slept deeply. When I woke up, Mom was already bustling in the kitchen. Rushing to take out my hair curlers, I heard a knock on my door before I could style my hair. You don't need to bother with your hair today, dear. I've got to leave for work early, Mom said. As I was about to hug her goodbye, the doorbell chimed. I'll get it on my way out, honey. You get ready, Mom said before answering the door. Standing in front of the mirror, I debated whether to style my hair or not. Mom greeted Quinn and Geminifer at the door. Hearing their voices, my heart raced. Mom directed them to wait while I got dressed. Feeling panicked, I hastily dressed, realizing my hair was still partly pinned up. Before I could finish, Quinn and Geminifer barged into my room. We can't wait any longer, Jonas. We have something urgent to discuss, Quinn began, but halted as she noticed my appearance. I knew it was Jonas, Geminifer exclaimed, pointing out remnants of mascara and my eyebrows. Feeling mortified, I sank onto my bed, anticipating the worst. Quinn sat beside me, offering support. There must be an explanation, Jonas. It's none of our business, but if you want to talk, we're here, Quinn said gently. I found solace in Quinn's gentle demeanor as I attempted to explain my situation to the girls. Quinn seemed understanding, while Geminifer wore a disdainful expression. When I paused, Geminifer made a disapproving noise and pointed out a piece of pink fabric under my shirt, insinuating something about my sexuality. Quinn intervened, urging Geminifer to ease off and reminding her that my choice of bedtime attire was personal. She also hinted at Geminifer's own behavior, suggesting she shouldn't judge. Despite feeling stung by her words, I sensed she wasn't directing them at me. As Geminifer took a seat, Quinn continued, informing me about our boyfriends discovering our activities at Senior's Night. Despite the fond memories, the news of their anger, particularly Ben's, who was Geminifer's boyfriend, erased any hint of amusement. Quinn recounted how a girl from our school, Ben's sister Alice, had suspicions about our attendance and mentioned my name. This led to our boyfriends demanding to meet me, potentially resulting in trouble, especially for me. Despite my fear, anger simmered within me. Why do you tolerate their behavior, Quinn? If they're so awful, why stick around? Why not stand up to them? Easy for you to say, Mr. Sissy, Geminifer retorted. You try standing up to them and see what happens. Quinn stepped in to defend me again. Geminifer, stop. But she has a point, Jonas. We've tried to break away before, but they have control over everyone in our neighborhood. They're idolized by adults, seen as perfect gentlemen with bright futures. Meanwhile, they intimidate us and attack any guy who even glances our way. We're trapped. They left school for college training camps, and we haven't had a moment's peace since. They made it clear we're still theirs, and that's that. When we heard about Senior's Night and your reputation, we thought it would be fun. We know we're responsible for getting you involved, and we hoped you might have some ideas. Her eyes teared up, and I sensed her sincerity, but I also realized how they manipulated me, even now. They had used me to gain entry to Senior's Night without regard for the consequences. Despite knowing they only associated with me out of necessity, I had seen our interactions as genuine friendship. There were laughs, cuddles, and kisses, albeit amidst teasing. They had even tried to reach out to me recently, but I had been preoccupied with family issues. Now, it seemed, it was time to face the consequences of our past actions. It took me a few minutes to process everything, and the room fell into silence. Quinn sat with a furrowed brow while Geminifer paced in front of us. As I mulled over the situation with the boys, the tension in the room seemed to escalate. Suddenly, Quinn broke the silence. Would you two knock it off? I'm trying to think here, and you're both driving me nuts. Geminifer halted her pacing and glanced at me. 
I had been absent-mindedly fiddling with my hair, pulling it back and letting it fall. When Quinn spoke, I froze with my hands behind my head. Quinn's expression softened into a faint smile. Gemini and I exchanged puzzled looks as Quinn led us into the living room, clearly focused on something brewing in her mind. She dialed a number. Hello, Alice. It's Quinn. How are you? Listen, Alice, the boys called on Saturday, upset about Senior's night. What did you tell them about Jonah's? Quinn chuckled, though it lacked genuine amusement. Alice, where did you meet Jonah's? Another pause. Seriously? It seems like you're trying to stir trouble or need new glasses. Jonas won't be thrilled when Esther learns you mistook her for a guy. And the boys won't find it amusing either. Quinn glanced at me, and I grew uneasy about her intentions. Yes, Alice, Jonas is a girl, Quinn continued. She was dressed formally because she was one of the officials. Although the other officials were casually dressed, I had opted for a more formal attire to impress my dates. Alice, you seem skeptical. Maybe we'll have to resort to that, but for now, call your brother and clear this up. Quinn's tone grew sharper, and she slammed the receiver down, her frown indicating the outcome hadn't been ideal. Well, plan A didn't work, so maybe plan B will. I was too scared to inquire about Quinn's thoughts, but Gemini's impatience prompted her to demand an explanation. Quinn rubbed her temples and spoke quickly. Here's the deal. Alice saw us with Jonas, but mostly from behind. As we got off the boat, someone called out to Jonas, giving her the name, but she only caught a glimpse of his clothes and long hair. So, based on that, she assumed Jonas was a boy that night. I tried to convince her otherwise, but I'm not sure she bought it. But look at him now. She held my face in her hands. With his hair and makeup from last night and the right clothes, Jonas transforms into Jonasandra, our girlfriend. What do you think? Gemini glanced between us. I think you're insane. Fooling a few people might work, but trying to deceive Ben and Dave, who know everything about girls? It's impossible. Remember last night? It took us a while to realize who the girl in the passenger seat was after you left with your mom, Quinn countered. We recognized your car and your mom, but it wasn't until this morning that it clicked. But last night was different, Gemini argued. It was dark, and we only saw his head and shoulders. Imagine Ben and Dave scrutinizing him up close in broad daylight. We don't stand a chance. Listen, Quinn said, determined. We'll doll him up and see how it goes. We have until Saturday to practice and perfect everything. It's not much time, but unless you have a better idea, we're out of options. I believe we can pull this off. We'll make him up, pad him a bit, dress him right, and practice until Saturday. What do you say, Jonas? Will you help us out? I was stunned by Quinn's suggestion. She wanted me to pretend to be a girl in front of those boys. I couldn't even find the words to object. I looked at Gemini, hoping she'd protest but she seemed to be considering the idea. Memories of past experiences flashed through my mind, and I felt a twinge of excitement at the prospect of fully embracing the role. Yet, the fear of what Ben and Dave might do if they discovered the truth overwhelmed me. Can you imagine the beating I'd endure if Ben and Dave saw through the act? Quinn delivered the decisive blow. If we don't try, we'll all end up getting beaten anyway. So, what do you have to lose? she was spot on. Left unsaid was the implied threat that if I refused, they might spread the story of my hair and makeup around town. Eventually, I simply shrugged and asked them what they needed me to do. Quinn's grin widened. Can you recreate your hair and makeup from last night? Yeah, I think so, I replied uncertainly. Then get to it. Gemma and I have errands to run, but we'll be back soon. Don't go anywhere. With a wink, she grabbed Gemini's arm, and they exited. I waited a few minutes after they left, allowing myself time to contemplate how I ended up in this predicament. Resigned yet oddly excited at the prospect of fully embracing the role of a girl, I settled at Mom's vanity and meticulously styled my hair and applied makeup. 
Despite feeling nervous and embarrassed about revealing myself to the girls in this manner, there was an undeniable thrill of adventure. Even after finishing my hair and makeup, I had nearly an hour to stew in anticipation. Attempting to occupy myself with chores proved futile as my anxious stomach kept me mostly confined to the bathroom. Suddenly, Quinn and Gemma burst in, laden with bags. Their reaction upon seeing me was a mixture of surprise and admiration. It was Geminifer who spoke first. You know, we might have a better chance than I thought. Jonas, you make a stunning girl. Her compliment sent a rush of heat to my cheeks. And your hair, can you help me style mine like that? Geminifer asked eagerly. Um, yes, I think so. Yours is a bit longer, though, so we might need to set it first to add some volume, I replied, lifting a lock of her hair. Catching sight of Quinn's knowing smile, I realized I had seamlessly slipped into a different mindset, a different role. Quinn seemed to notice the shift too, but she refrained from teasing, sensing the gravity of the situation. Let's focus on getting our little girlfriend here ready first, Geminifer, Quinn said, urging her friend. They swiftly emptied the bags onto my bed, revealing a plethora of items for a complete feminine ensemble. Lingerie, a dress, two skirt and blouse sets, shoes, belts, jewellery, and more. They brought a variety of sizes to ensure the best fit and appearance. Geminifer handed me an electric razor from her purse. First things first, head to the bathroom and shave your legs until they're completely smooth. Then, put these on. She passed me a pair of white nylon panties. And don't forget to shave under your arms too, then come back here. Blushing, I turned and headed into the bathroom. When I returned wearing only the panties and my shirt, both girls were smiling, their demeanor now playful. As I approached the bed, Quinn ran her hand down my thigh teasingly. My, 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 aren't we soft and smooth, she remarked, eliciting a noticeable reaction from me. Well, Geminifer exclaimed, eyeing my panties, at least one of us is enjoying this a little. Quinn, our new girlfriend seems to have a very unladylike issue here. What should we do? My embarrassment caused the issue to subside immediately, but it was evident the girls had planned this scenario. Quinn handed me a sanitary napkin and a thin elastic belt from her purse, instructing me on how to fix it into place before sending me back to the bathroom to position it properly. Once I returned with the napkin and panties back in place, the girls guided me through putting on a bra, padding it with falsies. They then helped me into a garter belt before sliding stockings over my smooth legs. Grateful for the napkin's concealment, I proceeded to don a half-slip, camisole, white blouse, and a tan-pleated skirt with a tight belt. The outfit was completed with white sandals featuring one-inch heels. Amidst the excitement of dressing up, any lingering shame dissolved, replaced by sheer enthusiasm. I began to feel like just one of the girls, until I caught sight of myself fully dressed as a girl in the mirror. I had to touch my face to confirm it was really me before nearly fainting, needing Quinn's hand to steady myself. We spent some time examining my reflection in the mirror, exchanging makeup and hairstyling tips. With each compliment from the girls on my developing skills and sense of style, I grew more at ease. However, Quinn eventually brought us back to reality, and my girl lessons commenced in earnest. Over the next two hours, they rigorously drilled me on speaking, walking, standing, and sitting like a lady. We paused for sodas, and then Geminifer insisted I replicate her Gibson girl hairstyle. This sparked a discussion about my experiences at Betty's, leading to a lively exchange of makeup tips and styling Quinn's hair into a French roll. As hunger gnawed at us, the girls easily persuaded me to join them for lunch at our local mall. Given that they were from the other side of town, the likelihood of being recognized was low, and by now, I felt confident that my new and beautiful disguise concealed any traces of the old Jonas. We spent the rest of the afternoon browsing through trendy stores, with Geminifer using her dad's credit card to purchase additional items she thought I needed, including a purse, more shoes, jewellery, and other accessories. Early evening approached, and the girls decided it was time for another test. I called mom at work to obtain permission to have dinner at Quinn's house. 
Mom expressed genuine happiness that I had reconciled with the girls, although she didn't pry for details, and I certainly didn't disclose my attire. I couldn't believe we managed to deceive someone as sophisticated as Quinn's mom. We devised a careful plan to explain things if she discovered the truth, but fortunately, it wasn't necessary. Both Quinn's parents appeared completely accepting of me as Quinn's new girlfriend. Mrs. Sims even suggested I accompany them on their next weekend trip to their lakeside cabin, which amused Gemini for greatly. After dinner, we excitedly retreated to Quinn's bedroom, giggling and teasing about my debut as a real girl and my successful interaction with Quinn's parents. In the distance, the doorbell rang, and Quinn's mother announced visitors. The girls leaped up and dragged me along as they rushed to the front door. Upon opening it, we were greeted by three tall guys, and Quinn welcomed them as if she had been anticipating their arrival. Hi, guys, you're just in time. Let us grab our purses, and we'll be ready to go. Oh, by the way, this is the friend we mentioned. Jenny, meet Paul, David, and Jim. They all greeted me in unison with a cheerful hello, causing me to blush and manage only a feeble high. My knees felt weak, barely supporting me as I stumbled back into the bedroom. Quinn, Geminifa, what's going on? You never mentioned any of this. What are we doing? I stammered. Calm down, Jonas. We're just going out for burgers and a movie. We'll be back well before your curfew, Quinn reassured me. A movie? We're going out. This can't be serious. I protested. Shut it, Jonas, Geminifer retorted sharply. You need to be 100% convincing when you meet Ben and Dave. Tonight, you'll get some practice acting like a girl around guys. Now, grab your purse and let's go. I stood there dumbfounded as Geminifer pulled me out the door, my knees trembling. Before I knew it, I found myself in the back seat of David's car. Geminifer sat in the front next to David, while Quinn maneuvered so that I was sandwiched between her and Jim on the right, with Paul on my left. It was evident I was to be Paul's date for the night. We headed to the same burger place Quinn and Geminifer had spotted me the night before, which now felt like ages ago. The conversation flowed quickly and lightly, with the girls pulling me into their banter occasionally. As I got the hang of conversing from the other side, I began to chime in on my own. Paul's dry wit made me laugh more than once, and I found him a bit more intellectually stimulating than the other two. As we neared our destination, I realized we were heading to the drive-in movie at the edge of town. As we entered the gate and found a spot near the back row, panic began to set in. Knowing the girl's reputation, especially Geminifer's, I anticipated more than just watching the movie. When Geminifer glanced back at Quinn, I shot her a desperate help-me look, receiving only a smile and a wink in return. Follow our lead, they had instructed, but I wasn't sure I wanted to follow them down whatever path they were leading. As the lights dimmed and the advertisements flickered on the screen, Geminifer edged closer to David in the front seat. With four of us already crammed in the back, Jim moved closer to Quinn. Feeling frozen in place, I noticed Paul sensing my unease, remaining still himself. Thankfully, conversation continued during the ads and previews, allowing me to relax slightly. The boys started cracking jokes at the dialogue on the screen, showcasing their cleverness. The atmosphere remained light and cheerful as the main feature started. All three boys shifted their arms over the back of the seat, appearing to settle in more comfortably. Even in the dimness, I noticed the subtle movements as Geminifer and then Quinn leaned into their dates, allowing the boys' arms to rest on their shoulders. Within seconds, I felt the warmth of Paul's hand on my shoulder through the thin fabric of my blouse. I had intended to relax and go with the flow, but I was certain Paul noticed my immediate tensing up. It became clear to me then that I wasn't mentally prepared for this, everything was happening too fast. Perhaps Quinn sensed my discomfort. She spotted someone walking by with popcorn and drinks and casually remarked that we had forgotten to buy some before the movie began. In no time, she and Gemma had all three boys heading off to the snack bar, leaving the three of us alone. Jonas, what's wrong? Things seemed fine until the movie started, Quinn asked, sensing my unease. 
I'm just not ready for a guy's arm around me. I don't know what to do or how to handle it, I admitted. Handling it is like handling any other situation with a boy. You let him progress to a certain point, then you gently set boundaries. If he crosses them, you move him back, Quinn explained. Simple. Right, I replied, though feeling anything but confident. For the next few minutes, the girls coached me on managing interactions with guys. By the time the boys returned, I felt dizzy with all the advice, but the girls assured me they had it under control. As the boys settled back into the car, Paul's arm found its way around my shoulders again. Knowing the girls were there to intervene if needed, I managed to relax a bit. I began to understand what the girls had tried to convey to me. The rest of the evening served as a real eye-opener as I watched the girls interact with the guys. Thankfully, Paul was more of a gentleman than the others and respected boundaries. We shared a few cuddles and ended up holding hands on the ride home. By the time we arrived back at Quinn's house, I was patting myself on the back for navigating through such a delicate situation. It wasn't until David turned off the engine that I realized I hadn't even thought about how to handle saying goodnight. Paul took my hand as I stepped out of the car, his fingers intertwining with mine as he closed the door. Under the shelter of a nearby tree, Geminifer and David had retreated deeper into the shadows. Quinn and Dave stayed by the car as Paul guided me up the sidewalk towards the porch. As we reached the door, Paul wrapped his arm around my waist. I had a hunch about what was coming, but my mind was blank on how to respond. His hold was firm, and as he drew me closer, my head tilted back instinctively, my eyes closing reflexively. A soft gasp escaped my lips as I felt the gentle pressure against them. Then, his warm breath mingled with mine, and I realized he was kissing me. My head spun, my knees weakened, and I grasped his arms for support. Taking my reaction as encouragement, he drew me closer still. After what felt like an eternity, he broke the kiss and gazed into my eyes. Confusion clouded my thoughts as he leaned in for a second kiss. I closed my eyes and parted my lips, only to be startled by the intrusion of his tongue. Suddenly, clarity dawned, and I pushed away, stumbling backward through the door. Leaning against it, I struggled to catch my breath and steady myself. Eventually, I sank to the floor, still trying to process what had just happened. Some minutes later, Quinn and Geminifer burst in, bombarding me with questions and chatter. My mind raced, grappling with the reality of having kissed a guy, not once but twice. Yet, I knew this was a crucial step in our plan to deceive Ben and Dave. During the ride home, we discussed tactics for handling guys, and I confronted them about manipulating our dates. Welcome to the real world, Jonas. If only they weren't so pushy, things might be different, Quinn remarked. Are all guys like that? I queried. Geminifer shot me a knowing glance. Mostly, yes. But for now, you need to embrace your feminine side completely. You've got to be irresistible by the time Ben and Dave return. Mull over that while Quinn and I make arrangements for the next few days. As we neared my house, I realized I had a couple of problems, Mom had. Never seen me fully dressed as a girl. Not only that, but I was sure. She had been expecting me home much earlier. I had left my guy clothes. At home, so it wasn't like I could go back to Quinn's and change. I guess it was time to see how far Mom was really willing to let her son go with his interests. I drew a deep breath and, with all the femininity I could muster, I walked through our front door and into the living room. Mom was on the sofa, and she was speaking as she turned toward me. Hello, dear. You're back a bit late. Did you have a good time with the girls? She paused, noticing my attire. Oh, goodness, she gasped, tears welling in her eyes. I feared I had ruined everything, thinking my brief stint as a girl was over. But she embraced me, saying, Oh, darling, you look so stunning. I'm sorry for the tears, I just never expected to see you dressed like this. You're not upset with me, Mom? Oh, not at all, my dear. It's just unexpected, that's all. 
I suppose I had imagined being there when you bought your first dress. Tears welled up in my eyes, and when we finally stepped back and met each other's gaze, we burst into laughter, noticing our smudged mascara once again. After wiping each other's eyes, we settled on the sofa. I recounted everything to Mom, though I omitted the true reason behind Geminifer and Quinn's fascination with dressing me up. When I reached the part about Paul and me on the porch, I hesitated briefly before realizing I needed Mom's guidance. So, I shared all the details with her. Don't blame yourself for the kisses, darling. You mentioned wanting to understand the girl experience, and kisses are a common aspect of it. You were wise to halt it when you did. Boys can be easily led but challenging to stop if things progress too far. I nodded in understanding. One more thing, sweetheart. Your skirt seems a tad short, don't you think? If you find this skirt short, you should have seen what Quinn and Geminifer wore, especially Geminifer. We could see the tops of her stockings when she sat down. Well, I don't want to criticize your friends, dear, but they might not be the best example of what's typical for a girl your age. You, more than anyone, should understand the impact such a short length can have on young men. She was correct, and I acknowledged that. Just then, the phone rang, and Mom answered. Hello. Yes, speaking. Who's calling? Mom glanced at me briefly. Well, Paul, we typically don't accept calls this late at night. Yes, I understand. Paul. How did he get my number? Geminifer. Undoubtedly. Yes, that's fine. She's right here. Mom smiled, emphasizing the word as she handed me the phone. I blushed, realizing I had to use my newly adopted feminine voice in front of Mom. But there was no turning back now. Hello. Jenny, it's Paul. Hi, Paul. I glanced at Mom, and she still wore that knowing smile. I had a really nice time tonight, and I wanted to apologize for my behavior. Oh, Paul, there's no need to apologize. Well, after we got home, Quinn called me and gave us a piece of her mind about our conduct, and she was right. I guess we all got a bit too carried away. That's okay, Paul. We'd like to make it up to you girls. Would you have dinner with us Thursday night at the Elms? It'll be formal, coats and ties, on our best behavior. Please say yes, the other girls said it's up to you. It seemed Quinn and Gemma had things planned for the next few days. Thursday night. I glanced at Mom, and she nodded her approval. What was I getting myself into? But how could I say no? Um, I suppose that would be fine, Paul. Great. Ah. Uh, Thanks so much. I promise we'll behave. Seven o'clock, then? Yes, seven works. Good night, Jenny. Good night, Paul. When I told Mom about the invitation to the Elms, she got excited. We'll go shopping tomorrow after I finish work and find you the perfect dress. Hurry and change for bed, then come to my room, we'll do each other's hair and discuss our plans. Her obvious excitement was just a little too much for me. Mother, how? Can you be so excited about your son dressing up like a girl and going? On dates? I mean, I'm not complaining, exactly, but don't you feel? Like this is all a little too weird. Darling, you're the one who accepted the invitation, right? I nodded. Of course, it was your decision, correct? Blushing, I nodded again. A sense of shame started creeping in. Since you've decided, let's just enjoy ourselves. I've been imagining what it would be like to have a daughter to do fun things like shopping. Now I finally get to experience it. I just shook my head and walked down the hall, wondering again why I was doing all these strange things. When I looked into my room, though, I suddenly forgot all about being confused or ashamed. Mom had been as good as her word, laid out on the bed was a complete peignoir, set all in white ruffles and lace. There was a nightgown, panties, a full-length robe, and slippers to match. My heart skipped a beat as I stared at that beautiful lingerie. It was gorgeous, and it really was mine. I hurried as best I could to put my new possessions neatly away, then reveled in the luxury of pulling on 
Those beautiful night things. When I skipped into Mom's room there was. Another surprise waiting for me. She was wearing exactly the same. Peña. As we stood together at her full-length mirror, we really did look like mother and daughter. I went first, sitting at Mom's vanity as she brushed and curled my hair. Then she returned the favor. She assisted with the curlers, but I managed to get the hang of it. Throughout, we discussed the boys, girls' fashion, and their interactions. You're gaining insight into relationships, huh? Hopefully, it won't make you cynical about girls. They're not all like Gemini for. I can tell that, Mom. Quinn seems very different, although she goes. Along with Gemma up to a point. But it seems mostly the guy's fault. Anyway, if they had more interest in us as people, and not just as the next conquest, they'd see through these little games. We wouldn't have to manipulate them at all, really, and we still could have a great time. Well, sweetheart, if you can just remember that when the shoe is back on the other foot, this whole experience will have been worthwhile. Her comments made sense, and I began to think of myself on my next date. As a guy. For some reason, the thought made me vaguely uneasy, would. I remember these things well enough to act differently? Exactly when? Would I go out again as a guy? I lay awake for a long time that night, experiencing all the sensations. Of the soft, silky clothes I was wearing, and thinking about the fun. Talk mom and I had. Then my mind turned to my date with Paul, and what? Thursday night might bring. When I finally fell asleep I had several. Dreams that I'd rather not discuss, but I slept really well. On Wednesday, I woke up eagerly anticipating the plans for the next day. I quickly showered, ensuring my curlers stayed dry, then dressed and applied makeup. Removing the curlers, I effortlessly styled my hair into a French roll, which I had practiced with Quinn the previous day. Quinn called right after breakfast, and we went shopping together again. It was another intense day of learning femininity, but I found it surprisingly enjoyable. They brought me home just in time to meet Mom, and we embarked on a marathon shopping spree. I forgot my fatigue as I tried on countless party dresses in almost every store in town. Mom bought me more lingerie, skirts, blouses, and two pairs of shoes. Between discussions about clothes, makeup, and shoes, Mom critiqued my new feminine voice and mannerisms. We also talked about my upcoming date with Paul and do's and don'ts. I realized Mom was insightful about relationships, despite being out of the dating scene for a while. For my dinner dress we selected a shade of rose that Mom and the Sales lady agreed was one of my best colors. The design of the dress was modest, for mom, but sophisticated enough to satisfy me. I had the impression that I would be competing with some eye-catching fashions on Quinn and Gemini for, and I didn't want Paul to feel like he'd gotten the wallflower among the roses. The dress had a draped neck and bodice, rather high, and a straight skirt with just a hint of a slit in. The side. Mom bought me a pair of matching pumps with heels that were almost three inches high, and some clip on earrings and a necklace. When she offered to buy me a set of lingerie that also matched, I readily agreed. That night, Mom had me model my purchases, then we curled each other's hair again. It was exciting and, at the same time, a little amazing to me that Mom was so. What? so open to the idea that her only son was now dressing up and going out on a date with a guy. As I thought about it, I realized that, while I was still a little amazed at myself, part of me was very excited with what I was doing. Thursday evening at seven, I was just finishing my makeup when the doorbell rang. Mom greeted Paul and ushered him into the living room while I put on the final touches. My stomach churned with nerves, evident by the flush beneath my makeup. I couldn't pinpoint the cause of my anxiety, my mind was solely focused on completing my beauty routine. Thankfully, Mom engaged Paul in conversation, easing the tension. Paul stood as I entered, holding a corsage that matched my dress. Mom smoothly accepted it on my behalf, 
sparing us any awkwardness. Despite my reluctance, Mom insisted on capturing several photos of us together. As we left, I was surprised to find David and Dave waiting in Paul's car, they had decided to pick me up first. Apologizing sweetly, I thanked them as Paul held the door open. Maintaining etiquette, I slid across to unlock the driver's door, opting to stay in the middle seat beside Paul rather than returning to my side. Gemma and Quinn stalled intentionally, leaving me to converse with the three guys for fifteen minutes. Fortunately, Dave and David enjoyed discussing themselves and their sports achievements, and I managed to keep up. Though Paul didn't reveal much about himself, I gathered from the conversation that the others held him in high regard. As the girls descended the stairs, we were all momentarily speechless. The boys had pledged to behave impeccably, and it was evident that Quinn and Geminifer intended to put them to the test. While my dress exuded sophistication with modesty, there's left little to the imagination. Geminifer, especially, wore a daring yellow halter-style shift that accentuated every curve, sans undergarments. Despite the lingering stares directed at Gemma, the evening proceeded without incident. It was amusing to observe the boys, including Paul, struggling to avert their gaze from Gemma's attributes. I found myself torn between watching her and observing the boys' attempts not to stare. They were so preoccupied that they failed to notice the amused exchanges between Quinn and me throughout the night. Personally, I thought Quinn looked just as stunning in her black spaghetti strap slip dress, and I had to refrain from staring at her in an unbecoming manner. At some point during the evening, I discovered that Quinn and Geminifer had already arranged another date for the following night, contingent upon the boys' good behavior. As they drove us home, we conceded that they had indeed been perfect gentlemen. Well, their hands, at least, had remained respectful, even if their eyes hadn't. We agreed to meet at Gemma's house on Friday night and head to the amusement park in the neighboring town. When Paul escorted me to my front door, I was pleased with his demeanor compared to the other two. He had made an effort to engage in conversation with Quinn and me throughout the evening. Concluding that he had upheld his promise to behave, I felt he deserved a small reward. Giving my hand a goodnight squeeze, I leaned in and offered him a kiss. He responded without hesitation, but to my relief, he kept it simple and didn't attempt anything further. On Friday morning, Betty took the day off work to accompany me on our second shopping excursion. Mom had filled her in on my recent dates, and Betty was thrilled to indulge in some girl time with me. I was starting to grasp the allure of shopping for girls, the attention, the enjoyable discussions about colors and accessories, and the camaraderie we shared. It offered a sense of companionship and equality that I hadn't experienced in typical boyish activities. Betty drove us for over an hour, leading us to a special store she had heard about called The Spotlight, which primarily served the theater industry. She explained that if I was going on dates, I needed more than just basic enhancements for my figure and something better than a sanitary napkin to maintain my profile. Surprisingly, I didn't feel embarrassed as she described the items we would be purchasing. Upon entering the store, we were greeted by a rather flamboyant man who offered assistance. When Betty inquired about gaffes, his response nearly caused us to burst into laughter. Yes, honey, we do carry gaffes. But if you girls are shopping for your boyfriends, they should really come in for a proper fitting. Leaving the store, I was now the proud owner of three shaping garments and a set of adhesive fake breasts that felt surprisingly realistic. Initially, it was awkward to have Betty and the clerk assisting with such intimate fittings. However, as time passed in the shop, I stopped fretting and focused on learning how to position everything correctly. With my new silhouette, I felt completely comfortable trying on the shorts and tops that Betty had purchased for me. During the journey home, the conversation shifted to my summer plans. Despite my reluctance to complain about Mom's decisions, I mentioned to Betty that the current dress and grooming standards had hindered my job search. Jenny, your mom mentioned her concerns about that to me, and I may have a solution, Betty offered, catching my attention. Business at the salon has been picking up, and I need extra help. However, I require someone who can handle both shampooing and assisting with beauty work. 
The candidates I interview for shampooing are unwilling to engage in stocking and cleanup duties, and vice versa. I don't have enough work to hire two separate individuals full time. If you're willing to handle both tasks, I can offer you a nearly full time position for the summer. That sounds fantastic, but would your clients be comfortable with a shampoo boy instead of a shampoo girl? I inquired. Who would inform them that you're a boy? Betty countered with a chuckle. My mouth hung open momentarily. So, you're suggesting I work at your salon all summer as a girl? Betty laughed softly. I believe everyone, including yourself, would feel more at ease with that arrangement. Besides, you still have two weeks to keep your hair up, don't you? And I need someone to start immediately. I doubt you'd want to dress as a boy with your hair styled like that around the shop, would you? Well, no, but. And you couldn't just start as a girl and then switch back to being a boy after two weeks, could you? I fell silent as I grasped her implication. If I accepted her job offer, I'd be dressing as a girl all summer. Until then, I hadn't really considered the duration of this charade. I suppose I had assumed it would somehow conclude after the next two weeks of adhering to mom's standards. If Quinn's plan succeeded, we'd be rid of the boys by Saturday night. Wouldn't the girls then expect me to revert to being a boy? But then I thought of my conversations with mom, our shopping trips, and the enjoyment I'd experienced in the past few days. Clearly, mom was content with me dressing up, and I hadn't felt this close to her in years. Accepting Betty's offer meant we could maintain that closeness all summer. Just then, Betty interjected with the deciding argument, the job starts at a dollar above minimum wage, and you keep all the tips you earn as a shampoo girl. A thrill ran through me as I accepted Betty's offer, and she genuinely seemed pleased to have me on board as her new shampoo and stock girl. We agreed that I would start the following Monday. During the drive home, Betty mentioned that Geminifer had called and requested that the three of us come in for treatments on Saturday morning. Apparently, Geminifer wanted us all to look our best for the boys. Betty inquired about our plan to deceive the boys, indicating she viewed it as a harmless prank. I was relieved that Gemma hadn't divulged our true motives. I knew Betty would inform Mom, especially if she thought I might be in any danger. I thanked Betty profusely as she dropped me off and she assured me she had enjoyed the day as much as I had. She mentioned she had three special hairstyles planned for us the next morning. I barely had time to freshen up and shave my legs before heading to Gemma's. They were impressed to see my new features and my revealing outfit. I explained that Betty and I had made some special purchases to enhance my figure. They asked if I was feeling a little sexy, and I had to admit that I was. The girls were obviously pleased and explained that the boys would be expecting a reward for their behavior on our dinner date. I didn't need to ask what they meant, and I mentally prepared myself for setting boundaries with Paul. The boys clearly appreciated our appearance when they arrived. Following the other girl's example, I greeted Paul with a brief kiss and allowed him to put his arm around me as we made our way to the amusement park. Holding hands, we joined the guys in purchasing tickets and headed directly to the Ferris wheel. As the Ferris wheel began its ascent, we turned our attention to the scenery unfolding around us. The initial speed of the ascent was slightly overwhelming. Glancing back at Quinn and Dave in the seat behind us, I noticed they were already lost in each other, oblivious to their surroundings. It stirred a slight pang of envy within me. Turning my gaze forward, I saw Geminifer and David smiling and waving at us before Geminifer leaned in to plant a firm kiss on his lips. A flutter danced in my stomach as I felt Paul's fingers on my chin, signalling what was to come. Strangely, I found myself wanting to kiss Paul. He had proven himself to be a perfect gentleman the previous night, true to his word. He deserved more than just a brief peck on the lips. To resist now, especially in front of the others, would dent his ego, which he didn't deserve. Smiling into his eyes, I moistened my lips as he turned my face towards his. His hand caressed my cheek, and as our lips met, it was a soft, tender kiss that seemed to linger indefinitely. When we paused to catch our breath, I realized that Gemma, Quinn, and their dates were all observing us. 
though I felt my cheeks flush with embarrassment, I was determined not to show it. Smiling vaguely, I reached up to run my fingers through Paul's hair, drawing his head closer to mine as I pressed my lips against his again. His arm wrapped around my waist, drawing me nearer, and this time, when I felt his tongue, I didn't pull away. Opening my lips wider, I fully reciprocated his kiss. The scent of his aftershave mingled with my perfume, heightening the sensory experience. The combination of the ferris wheel's motion, the surrounding scents and sensations, and the realization of what I was doing overwhelmed me. For several blissful minutes, I surrendered to the warmth of his breath, the softness of his lips, and the gentle exploration of his tongue. Everything came crashing down on me when his hand slid from my waist to my exposed thigh. Although I felt a slight thrill, I abruptly realized I had reached my limit. Breaking our kiss, I gently guided his hand away from my thigh, but to avoid being too abrupt, I kept hold of it and intertwined our fingers. I sensed he understood he had overstepped, and we subtly distanced ourselves, turning our attention to the passing scenery. As soon as the wheel came to a stop, the girls whisked me away to the nearest restroom. They eagerly pressed me for every detail of our experience and how it felt. After freshening our lipstick, we rejoined the boys, who seemed slightly perturbed by our absence. However, with a few affectionate gestures and some playful coaxing, we quickly had them smiling again. Somewhere amidst the evening's events, I lost myself in the enjoyment of my date. Upon returning to Gemma's house, each couple found a secluded spot in the yard. I cherished several moments wrapped in the warmth of Paul's embrace, sharing tender kisses. Eventually, we bid each other good night, and Gemma directed Quinn and me to the basement where we could chat without disturbing her parents. On the way down the stairs Gemma and Quinn began taking off their shoes. Then there's shorts and tops. By the time we got to her rec room the girls had nothing on but their panties. Quinn disappeared into the bathroom, but Gemma turned to me and gestured toward the phone. Why? Don't you call your mom and see if you can sleep over with us? That way we can all go straight to Betty's in the morning? As Gemma finished talking she noticed the look on my face and she put her hands around my neck and smiled slyly into my eyes. Now, now, my little girlfriend. You need to save looks like that for your boyfriend Paul. Remember that. You're just one of the girls around here, at least until tomorrow. Night. Just then Quinn emerged from the bathroom wearing a little blue. Nighty. She threw a yellow baby doll top at me and both girls watched. As I slipped out of my shorts and top. For some reason I was feeling. Modest about my new chest and started to pull the baby dolls over my. Bra. When the girls were satisfied that they had done all they could. To mortify me, they had me phone my mom. Somehow, I knew what she. Would say but I had to give it my best shot. Hi mom, it's Jenny. Tomorrow morning, we're all scheduled to visit Betty's salon early, and the girls want me to stay over tonight so we can head there together. Is that all right with you? After a pause, mom finally replied. Darling, I'm glad you're embracing new adventures, and I support you. Ultimately, it's your decision, but think about how the other parents might react if they discovered your real situation. You're right. Mom. I'll be home soon. I turned and gave the girls a shrug, but they weren't prepared to just let it go. They insisted I wear the nightgown they'd provided, and we spent another hour together as Gemma and Quinn playfully teased me and cracked risque jokes. It was somewhat bizarre, yet I found myself laughing along with them before long. I realized they were just helping me get more comfortable with the role I was about to take on. Asterisk asterisk the big day asterisk asterisk. The girls didn't drop me off until nearly 4 a.m., but they were back at my doorstep by 8 a.m. sharp for our appointment at Betty's salon. Thankfully, since we were set to receive a full makeover at the salon, I quickly dressed and pulled my hair back into a ponytail. Gemma had insisted I wear her red miniskirt and matching blouse, complete with red high-heeled sandals she'd picked out for me. The outfit was accented with a gold chain belt, and Quinn added a matching gold chain necklace and two bracelets to finish the look. I was concerned Gemma's skirt, tailored for her longer legs, 
would reveal my garter tabs as I climbed into the car. Exhausted, I was too weary to fret about my exposure or feel anxious about the upcoming events. Upon arrival, Betty greeted us with two of her top stylists ready to begin. They started with a shampoo and set for each of us. As we sat under the dryers, we received manicures. My nails, which I hadn't trimmed in nearly three weeks, were shaped into an elegant almond by the manicurist. When it came to choosing a Polish, I immediately opted for a red that matched my skirt and shoes. After our hair was set, we gathered around Betty's table to discuss makeup strategies. The other girls went first, and by the time it was my turn, we were all thoroughly enjoying the process. Betty and her team lavished us with praise, telling us how fantastic we'd look for our boyfriends, with many compliments directed at me. I wasn't sure if this was all prearranged to boost my confidence, but I relished the special attention. I wondered, did Betty and her staff see me as just one of the girls? Just as I was about to leave the makeup chair, Gemma placed her hand on my shoulder. Hold on, Jenny, I think you're missing just one last touch to complete your look. She gestured towards the salon's window sign advertising a special on ear piercing. A wave of red washed over my face and my stomach churned. Despite feeling I should resist this permanent, feminizing alteration, I found myself unable to voice any objections. I had been secretly envying the earrings the other girls wore throughout the week, curious about how it would feel to wear my own. Resistance seemed futile, as Gemma had clearly coordinated with Betty in advance, the earrings were already prepped in a dish of alcohol beside me. As Betty marked the spots on my ears, Gemma mentioned that the boys would notice every detail, and this was just another step to ensure our ruse was flawless. Skeptical, I could only give her a look as my mouth was too dry to speak. Fortunately, I was sitting down because the slight pop of the earrings piercing my lobes nearly made me faint. Of all the transformations I had undergone recently, this one profoundly impacted me. Looking at the small diamonds now sparkling on my ears, I genuinely felt like a girl. When the stylists finished, Gemma's hair was styled into a perfect French roll with soft tendrils curling gracefully around her forehead and neck. Quinn's hairstyle was even more elegant, with her hair sleekly pulled back into cascading curls from the crown to her neck. Although I felt very feminine, I couldn't help but be captivated by her appearance, she looked stunning. They styled my hair with a side part, sweeping it back to the crown in a wave that elegantly covered the tops of my ears. The remaining hair, along with a matching hairpiece, was fashioned into a series of bouncy sausage curls that tickled my neck with every turn of my head. Delicate tendrils framed each ear. Betty had us pose for a series of photos, capturing individual and group shots with her and her stylists. Afterward, we headed to Gemma's place for the main event. As we left the salon, Betty embraced me warmly, remarking, See you bright and early Monday morning. Honorable I winced at her words, hoping the others hadn't noticed, but Betty didn't stop there. Noticing Gemma and Quinn's confused expressions, she revealed, Didn't Jenny tell you? She's joining us as the new stock clerk and shampoo girl on Monday. Gemma gave me a stunned look, as if I'd emerged from nowhere. She opened her mouth to speak, but Quinn nudged her gently in the ribs, saying, I think it's fantastic that Jenny's got a job lined up for the summer. Let's see you try to manage a regular job, Gemma. On the drive back to Gemma's house, she tossed a few sharp remarks my way, with Quinn jumping to my defense throughout. Gemma eventually tried to mask her discomfort with the idea of me dressing as a girl all summer, clearly harboring negative views about a guy who would do such a thing. Personally, I remained largely unfazed by the conversation. I found Gemma's attitude somewhat hypocritical given her active role in my transformation. More importantly, I felt an unexpected sense of comfort with my decision for the summer. Despite the new and unsettling emotions and experiences, it seemed like destiny had led me to this point. We had about an hour before the boys were expected, and we used it to fine-tune every aspect of our plan while doing some last-minute grooming and choosing perfumes. When the doorbell finally rang, I stayed in Gemma's room while the others went to greet their dates. I overheard the entire exchange. The boys started inquiring about Jonah's almost immediately, eager to meet him. 
The girls played along, feigning reluctance to comply with the boys' requests. Eventually, they relented and called me to come downstairs. I took several deep breaths before slowly opening the door from Gemma's room. My mouth was dry, and it took considerable effort to steady my trembling knees as I began descending the stairs. Initially, my gaze was fixed on my feet, but after navigating a few steps, I managed to muster a smile and looked up to see the boys for the first time. They were both impressively large, each standing well over six feet tall and built solidly. What really eased my nerves, though, were their stunned expressions. Their mouths hung open, and I could swear they were almost drooling. From my position on the stairs, I was acutely aware of how much they could see up my short skirt, noticing their eyes darting between my, slightly padded, panties and my face. A shiver ran through me as I realized my exposure, prompting me to hasten my approach to the bottom of the stairs. The realistic bounce in my bodice seemed to capture their second glance. The initial chill morphed into a thrill as I recognized the game was essentially won. I had become irresistible bait, and they were hooked. Although the other girls looked stunning and were probably prettier, their more modest attire meant I drew the most attention, aligning perfectly with our plan. The outcome of this scenario now just depended on precise timing. My smile grew genuine as Gemma introduced me to the two towering figures. I stood close enough to bend for him to catch the scent of my perfume. As Gemma mentioned his name, I gave his hand a warm squeeze and then tiptoed to plant a kiss on his cheek. I did the same with Dave, telling him the girls had shared so much about them that I felt we were already friends. The ensuing silence was palpable, thick enough to cut through. Gemma proposed that we move to the living room to become better acquainted. As we headed that way, the boys clumsily bumped into each other, with Ben nearly toppling over. Quinn and Gemma struggled to contain their laughter, while I discreetly covered my mouth to mask my amusement, I hadn't anticipated such a successful turnout from my little ruse. The boys and their dates crowded onto the sofa, and I took a seat in an overstuffed chair across from them. Crossing my legs, I was aware they had a clear view of my stocking tops and panties. Predictably, the boys were too distracted to follow the conversation. They likely wanted to grill us about the night of the party but seemed too embarrassed by their glaring oversight. Just then, Gemma's mom entered from the backyard, asking us to pick up some last-minute items for the cookout. In the car, Dave and Quinn took the back seat, while Gemma made sure I was seated between her and Ben in the front. We engaged in lively banter, and I embraced my role as a fun-loving, seasoned gal, matching Gemma and Quinn's vibes. As per our strategy, I seized every chance to touch Ben and share smiles, keeping the playful atmosphere alive even when we returned home. I could sense the boys, especially Ben, growing more entangled in our scheme. Known for his bold moves and quick conquests, Ben's daring nature was initially what drew Gemma to him. However, she quickly learned he didn't stop at just one conquest. Now, we all relied on Ben behaving predictably with his new target, me. Indeed, the moment presented itself just as we were about to sit down for the meal. Gemma's mom requested a second bottle of ketchup from the basement pantry. Gemma and Quinn, busy with a vegetable plate, suggested I fetch it instead. Agreeing to go, Ben offered to guide me to the pantry. I noticed a quick glance exchanged between Ben and Dave. As we started downstairs, Dave hung back slightly, seemingly taking on the role of a lookout. A sense of unease crept over me as I realized this wasn't their first time orchestrating such a plan. Would our timing hold up? We lingered at the beach house until late Sunday afternoon, and it was blissful every minute. The girls dedicated the time to enlightening me on everything I didn't know about relationships between boys and girls. It almost felt like a competition between them to see who could capture my attention the longest and provide the most enjoyment. There were a few short naps, and on Sunday morning, the girls convinced me to join them for a brief swim and sunbathing session, but most of our time was focused on intensive, pleasure endurance lessons. By the time they dropped me off at my house, I was completely exhausted and could barely walk. Quinn assisted me with my things to the front door and then gave me a long, deep kiss. I guess with your new job starting tomorrow, 
We'll have to say goodbye to Jonas for a bit, but we'll stop by the salon this week to see how Jenny is doing. With another swift kiss and a wink, she departed. Mom greeted me at the door and assisted me with my belongings to my room. Initially, she wore a stern expression, but noticing my physical and emotional exhaustion, she opted to keep the conversation light until after I had rested and eaten dinner. That evening, we discussed the events of the past few weeks. It turned out that Mom had pieced together quite a bit, including our little scheme with the boys and the happenings at the beach house. While she wasn't thrilled about some of my actions, she didn't judge me. Instead, she shared her concerns about the physical and emotional risks I was encountering and continued to face. We delved into what it meant for me to work all summer as a girl. Although I was still somewhat uncertain about where everything was headed, the job and circumstances felt oddly appropriate for me. We committed to maintaining complete honesty and discussing our feelings regularly. I was delighted by how close we were becoming again, which seemed to validate my choices for the summer. By the end of our conversation, Mom appeared to share my sentiments, uncertain of the future yet optimistic about what lay ahead.